Clerk, call the roll, please. Chairman Lynch? Present. Councilor Backer? Present. Councilor Fritz? Here. Councilor McGinty? Here. Councilor Moles? Present. Councilor Roberts? Here. Councilor Swift? Ayer? Here. Student Representative Armstrong? Student Representative Flynn? Manager McGovern? Here. Okay, time for the Pledge of Allegiance. The next item is actually missing from the agenda, but it is um, the time that we usually have for reports and correspondence. Uh, Councillor Roberts? Well, first off, I guess I'd like to thank those that came out to vote on Tuesday and uh, offer my congratulations to uh, Councillors McGinty and uh, Lynch for their re-election uh, on a hard-fought uh, <laughs> contest. And, uh, Congratulations as well to Trish Brigham and Rebecca Millett uh, for their elections as well. Well, thank you, Jeff, for your congratulations. Congratulations to Councilor Lynch. Um, I want to thank the voters for their support one more time. Um, I, uh, I accept uh, your challenge to, uh, in case the tax cap passes, we're probably wish we never ran for office, but um, I want to thank you for your support. Yes, I want to thank the voters, too. It's a privilege and a pleasure to um, serve in this town, and um, I was awfully glad since we were unopposed that we didn't lose to <laughs> a write-in candidate. Um, so um, thank you, voters. Um, I also just want to mention that most of the council attended a dinner on Saturday night. It was the appreciation dinner for our volunteer fire and rescue. And um, it's the one time of the year that I think we thank them formally for all of their, uh, you know, just incredibly great efforts for the year. Um, we could not um, even have the budget that we have if we did not have a volunteer fire and rescue, and um, I know all of us appreciate their work, so I just want to mention that publicly um, so that we can say thank you publicly to those people as well. Councillor swift Kayata. Thank you. Um, I also had one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, it's related to elections, but it's to an upcoming election. Um, we will be, be having uh, another election in June on the 8th and um, as well as voting for school board member and some federal and state offices, there will be a question, question one, which is a carryover measure, um, which was called question 1A when it was on the state ballot um, at the last general election. Um, and that question is, do you want the state to pay 55% of the cost of public education, which includes all special education costs, for the purpose of shifting costs from the property tax to state resources. I speak only for myself and not the council on this, but I want to urge everyone in Cape Elizabeth to become very well informed on this issue. Um, if question one passes, it will mean an additional $2.4 million to, to the Cape Elizabeth budget in an increase in um, education aid, uh, which will have a significant positive effect on our budget and um, will be of great help, especially if the Pulaski referendum passes in the fall. So I urge everyone to get out and vote. It's a very important issue for Cape Elizabeth. Thank you, Anne. David? If I can just add to what uh, Councillor Swift Kayata has mentioned, one of the, one of the uh, frequent positions in opposition to question one, as it is numbered for the June ballot, is the uh, fear that if question one passes, that it is, provides no guarantee that property taxes will actually be reduced as a result. Um, when this question was on the ballot um, in November as 1A, um, most if not all of the members of this 
town council uh, made a pledge to the public that if 1A passed, that we would uh, pass through to the voters by way of property tax reduction any amounts that Cape Elizabeth received um, in additional amounts through state education funding. So I would simply like to uh, renew my pledge uh, to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth um, that I would in fact vote to pass through by way of property tax reduction any increased amounts that Cape Elizabeth received um, as a result of the passage of question one as it will be on the ballot in June. Thank you, David. Okay, um, we have a report from the recycling committee. Um, Darren McClellan is here. Thank you, Darren. Just a couple of brief uh, numbers to start with. Uh, from March of 2004, we recycled 75 tons of material out of 349 tons total. Our recycling rate is 21.49%. Cape seems to steadily rise very slowly, but we do go up on recycling. And it's a very good time for recycling. Uh, I met with Steve Consoli of Regional Waste the other day. He manages the recycling division. He said that prices are up for all materials. Paper is up 90% over last year. The demand is incredible. He says he can't, he can sell everything he can get. Uh, Maine is noted for high quality recycling paper, which also helps us to get a much better price for what we produce. So it really is a good time to recycle everything you can. All the paper, all the cardboard, it all is really worth it. My main, two main goals tonight. First off, as you know, we've had a major turnover on the recycling committee in the last 16 months. Out of a committee of seven, we now have four new members and we have an open position. The application for that expires on May 21st. I'd like to encourage people to join up. We're a pretty active committee. Uh, we've Excuse me, we've started a couple of new initiatives. The first one is our backyard composter sale, which is ongoing right now. As of today, we've sold 83 units. Five dollars from the sale of each unit goes back to the recycling committee for further educational goals. The sample composter right now is at community services. Uh, and tomorrow, I believe, it's going to come here to town hall for the next week. There are order forms with the composter. Order forms can also be downloaded from the town's website. Uh, last day to accept orders will be the 20th of May, and the pickup will be the 26th at Public Works. Uh, we'd like to thank the Recycling Committee, we'd like to thank Bob Malley and the Public Works staff because they really encouraged us on this, and uh, they've done a great job to help us out. Uh, we're also at this time, we are looking at recycling of e-waste, cell phones and printer cartridges, and clothing and other textile recycling. And I'd like to close by just reminding everybody that Saturday is Household Hazardous Waste Collection from 9 to 1 at the Recycling Center. Uh, Clean Harbors will be there collecting hazardous waste. Some of the items being accepted this year are fluorescent bulbs, e-waste, all your computers, your TVs, your monitors. They will be taking them this year. Uh, gasoline, solvents, pesticides, antifreeze, brake fluid, all the other automobile fluid except for motor oil because motor oil is collected regularly. Uh, although the recycling center will be open and accepting regular waste, we ask if you can wait until after one to come in, it would really be appreciated because it can get a little crowded up there with people lining up for the hazardous waste and it would help everybody out a lot. And we will, the recycling committee will be there selling composters, so we encourage everybody to come. Thank you. Darren, thank you very much. We appreciate your efforts and um, I know we join in your encouragement for recycling uh, the uh, solid waste numbers in our budget continue to skyrocket and one of the few things that citizens can do to have some control over that portion of the budget is to recycle That's very true. as That's much true. waste as possible so thank you for your efforts thank you uh, uh, are there any other reports or correspondence okay. seeing none um, it's the time in our meeting for citizens discussion of items that are not on the agenda so if you are here for something that is on the agenda um, those items will be coming up shortly if you would like to bring something to the council's attention that is not on the agenda 
Um, now is a good time to do that. Okay. Seeing none, we will move to the next item, which is approval of the minutes of our three previous meetings, I think. We need to approve the minutes for um, Monday, April 12th. I think it was Wednesday, April 14th. And then Wednesday, April 28th. Can I have a so motion or? So move. Is there second. a second? Is there any discussion? All in favor? Three, four, five, six, seven, zero. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda, I need to double check this, but I think we, it actually is a public hearing that I'm opening up on. Should we do all of these public hearings on all of the budget items at one time? Is that, can we do that? Okay. Then I will open up the public hearing on the municipal school community service and county budgets, as well as sewer fund, Riverside Cemetery Fund, the museum at Portland Headlight, Spurwing Church Fund, the Fort Williams Park Capital Fund budget, the Thomas Jordan Trust Fund budget, the Rescue Fund budget, and uh, the acceptance of uh, grants. So if you are here to speak on any of those financial items, please come right up to the podium and state your name and address and appreciate your coming. Uh, my name is Nathan Speckman. I'm, I live on 18 Jewett Road. And uh, I'm a senior at the Cape Elizabeth High School. And uh, I am highly, highly involved in the, the theater there. And uh, from what I understand, uh, the budget will be cut by one third, our theater budget that is. And um, I'm just here to talk about that. Uh, I'm not here to speak on behalf of Mr. Mullen. I'm here of my own volition. And uh, I'm just here to say that Theater for me has been one of the, it's always, it's what I do and it's what I'm really passionate about. And I've done it all four years of my high school tenure and uh, it's, it's, it's one of the most important things to me. And to see the budget be cut by one third, it, it's not right. Uh, we have, for those of you who may not know, we have a lot roughly three shows a year and if the budget was to be cut by one third one of those shows would be lost and we have at each show at least 50 kids working on the show so all year there's 150 kids and so if one show was cut then 50 kids would be gone and there'd be no show during one of the seasons and uh, all three shows that we have are very very important we have the fall show the one act festival show and the spring musical and the One Act Festival is the big one where we go to different regional festivals around the town and we show our play to them and there's a big festival where all the other, all the other schools from a region, like th earlier this year we went to uh, Thornton Academy and there were all shows from all different schools from that region performing there. And uh, if you advance there, then you go on to state and then if you advance there, you go to, uh, then you go to New England's where you go all around New England. Uh, for Alice in Wonderland, my freshman year in 2000, we went to Guilford, New Hampshire. And uh, just to give you an idea of how far we've gone. And uh, that's where we get our awards. It's, it's where we get awarded, recognized, and it's where uh, the theater is really known at that point in time. And then the fall show is where new kids, newcomers to the theater, uh, freshmen to the school, anybody like that, where they can get used to it, used to the feel of it. Uh, they can get their feet wet and uh, they can just know what's going on so they can one day be a part of that one act cast. And then the musical is the, the final blowout show of the year. It's our, one of our most popular shows. And uh, it's just, it's basically a show for the seniors. It's their last show. And most of the time, uh, it's seniors do it as their SPP, their senior transition project. Right now, Spring Musical All-American is my senior transition project. And uh, 
So if we're to cut one of those shows, it's you'd be disappointing 50 kids, and it's all three shows are equally important. And uh, another point is, it was brought up that uh, we could have a booster group to raise money, and if this were if this were done, uh, it just wouldn't work because we have a mixed mixed group of kids in our theater program. We have people in sports, people who don't do sports, people who do music all around. And at one time, we have numerous kids that have to do music boosters, sports boosters, and all these other, all these other ones. And their parents are basically up to their necks in boosters, and they can't deal with it. And so it's, it just wouldn't work. And, uh, Um, yeah, uh, the bottom line is that theater is very, very important, not just to me, but to the school. Uh, the school has a really good reputation for its, act its extracurricular activities, and uh, it's, those are really what it's known for, and the theater is one of the highest ranking extracurricular activities there. We get some of the biggest audiences. We get some... We get sometimes more than sports, and it's, it's the highest ranking activity year after year. And uh, it's, it's just really important to me, being a senior, I'm going off to college next year. I want to know that the, high, the theater in the high school, which is uh, what has taught me most things in my life, and I've grown so much from the theater and from Mr. Mullen, that I'd hate to see, I'd hate to see anything happen to it, that no kid would have the same opportunities that I had and the same joys and just being able to feel everything that I've felt from freshman year going all through every festival all the way to the stage and then being nominated, uh, having Alice in Wonderland be nominated and help us go to Scotland last year which I was also a part of, and that was one of the greatest, one of the greatest moments of my life. And uh, just to see something happen to it, that no kid can have the same experience that I did, is heartbreaking. So, uh, just when you're going over the budget plan for next year, just keep all the aforementioned points in mind. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, Nathan, I would just point out as a process, the way our budget works, the town council will vote later this evening on an overall expenditure for the school department. Within that expenditure, and what is proposed is to increase the school budget by 8.1%. What happens with the money then is entirely up to the school board and the school department line by line. So I would encourage you, I think the school board is meeting tomorrow night um, in this room, and they, they set the priorities within the dollar amount that um, we will vote later tonight. So in terms of this program or that program, um, I would encourage you to share your views with the school board tomorrow okay. night. But thank you, thank you. very much. Okay. Is there anyone else? My name is Gail Atkins. I live at 1189 Shore Road, and I'm here also to put in a plea for more money for the school budget. Um, and I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm unhappy about other items that have also been cut, like spring pickup, and I've got piles of sticks all over my yard, which I don't know what to do with. So I know it's, it's always a tough decision for the council um, on how, how to spend the money and how to, or how to allocate the money to the different groups. But um, I have been um, trying since September of 2000 um, to have Latin offered at the high school. And um, at the time, there were signatures from 296 parents representing 638 students saying that they wanted Latin at the high school. Um, this is an academic subject that's offered at all of the other surrounding high schools. 
Um, the program has been offered at the high school for two years, but not without the threat of cuts each year and being canceled each year, which leads to confusion among parents and students when they're selecting the courses. The first year there was uh, one, two sections of Latin one. The second year, um, last year, they weren't going to offer Latin one because again of budget crunches and only so many dollars going to the school. And they were just going to offer Latin two. Uh, at the last minute they offered Latin one, um, but there weren't a lot of kids that were willing to rearrange their schedules to sign up, um, but they did have a Latin one class. Um, this year again, I heard there's more confusion and um, at the eighth grade open house, kids were going into the Latin teacher's room saying, gee, I understand there's not going to be Latin again. You know, we have this on again, off again program, which is, is due to money um, because the students want it, the parents want it, um, I believe the administration wants it, um, but the numbers have not been great in the program because every year it's being threatened with its on again, off again. Um, business. Um, hopefully you've all seen the article in the uh, April 23, 2004 issue of the, of the Century um, titled Cape Students Acclaimed for Latin. More than 80% of our Latin students, quote, received national acclaim as a result of their high scores in the annual national Latin exam. I feel that the entire Latin program is being judged and eliminated based on low numbers in the classes which I believe uh, were created by inconsistent and untimely information relayed by the administration and the school board due to budget cuts and money coming from the town council. Um, I also take issue with receiving a letter from the high school informing me that the Latin program has been eliminated when the final budgets have not even been voted on. Because of, of the low numbers in the, the program was easy to eliminate and ergo, that's Latin, so therefore. <laughs> Easy for the high school and the school board to find a quick and large cost savings, but how does eliminating an academic program like Latin, which is offered at all of the other local high schools, fit in with the quote, academic excellence, which uh, the administration and the school board are always touting as the goal for the Cape schools and students? Um, I'm not speaking out in hopes of saving Latin by eliminating other programs or someone's job, even though a great teacher has been lost, uh, has lost his job with the elimination of this program and is currently seeking um, positions as far as Boston. Uh, but in requesting that the, the high school and the school board uh, take a closer look at scheduling and course availability, that affects parents and students and hoping that the town council can take a look at money um, and maybe give a little more to the school. Though I do understand that no matter what you give them, they can decide what to do with it and I'll be bringing up that point. Um, a different schedule might translate into higher student participation in Latin, an academic subject that is in our students' best interest and should be offered by our high school, just like it is in all of the other local high schools with which our children compete. The administration and the school board must stand firmly behind the Latin program and not cut it or threaten to cut it every time there is a budget issue. I would like to mention that both my children are very active in the school sports program. I have heard that at the budget meeting, the mention of the elimination of the Latin program caused barely a mutter, but the mention of student fees for sports caused an uproar. How similar to last year's athletic situation where parents were divided, emails were flying, and the town seemed to be in turmoil over a sports-related item. But where is the concern when it comes to academics? Barely a mutter. Thank you, Gail. And again, I would just encourage you to go to the school board because we are only voting for the overall expenditure. And again, the priorities are entirely beyond our jurisdiction and are up to, it's up to the school board and the school department. So um, there's anyone else who would like to? Good evening, my name is Tom Egan. I live at 41 Hannaford Cove Road and have done so since 1980. And we have two children in the Cape Elizabeth School Department. 
uh, in high school now, and one graduated successfully last year. He's at Northwestern and took a great education with him, and we're so grateful for the school here, uh, all the schools. Now, before I begin, I want to say that I, I appreciate the efforts of the town council and the school board. You're all volunteers. You face a very difficult task with your respective budgets, and my comments tonight are not meant as criticisms of any individual or, you know, um, I'm, I'm taking positions that I feel need to be advocated on behalf of certain constituencies in the town. And, and some of you may feel like I do and others might not. And I just hope that you'll take my, my thoughts in good faith as I intend them to be. Um, with respect to the school, but the high school budget. Uh, my wife and I were invited by the athletic uh, director the other night to a meeting uh, at which all of the um, high school booster club presidents or officials uh, were also invited to discuss a proposed budget adjustment that the school board was suggesting or urging upon the athletic department, namely a $50,000 cut of approximately $415,000, I believe, of a total budget at the high school. And uh, the group spent two and a half hours discussing this prospect. And I think it's fair to say we all agree that this was the first time, to the best of our recollection, that these participation fees were not just being proposed, but were apparently a likelihood. And um, um, my reaction is that this is a very slippery slope that Cape Elizabeth schools will tread if participation fees become the norm. Uh, participation fees are antithetical to public education, in my opinion. And as I go forward, I guess I should respond to, to your comment, Mary Ann, that the school budget is the school budget is the school department's province and that they will make the decision as to what to cut and so on. So I'm going to address what I would believe is within your purview, namely the allocation of budgets between the town count, uh, the, the municipal budget and the school budget. So we're looking at the, I'm, I'll, I'll address the macroeconomic view here. There are certain revenue generating capacities here in town, such as uh, Fort Williams, that are, I, I'm not going to say sacred cows, but they're, that are appropriately viewed carefully. Um, and my view is that when we think about forcing parents of students who are already paying taxes, who are participating in a public education, and all that that means, when we are forcing upon them by way of cramming down a too low budget upon the school department, we are saying to the students, you shall pay an admission to play hockey, you shall pay an admission to play lacrosse, to Nordic ski or whatever it may be. And yet we're not asking non-residents who enjoy a wonderful facility at Fort Williams to make a very modest contribution to enter there. My wife, in her creative thinking, said, what an what a interesting sign one could put next to the little house as one drives into Fort Williams. Your small donation will help the youth of Cape Elizabeth you know, participate in athletics or theater or whatever it might be. And it's de that revenue is dedicated to the up upkeep of the, uh, of the park and to defray public school expenses. So I, I urge you, when you think about the budget this evening, to look back, look over to revenue sources <coughs> such as Fort Williams to enable the school board 
to avoid the slippery slope of participation fees. Now, I read in the current, I, no, the uh, Cape Courier the other day, an article in which, uh, regarding the budget, where the reporter mentioned that the town council was considering making a $70,000 contribution to the land trust, I think it was, for the purchase of, or to enable and support the purchase of, I think it might have been the Jordan Farm property. And this, in the context of the meeting that I had just attended uh, with the uh, athletic director who does such a good job, where the coaches are so good, I, I, th I remembered a meeting of a corporation, the board of a corporation on which I sit last December. And at the meeting we had a budget coming in and the board determined that we could, that we should not expend the revenue that was proposed by management. It's just in an inappropriate budget. So we sent it back to management and in February they came back, or January I guess it was, they came back with another budget and at that time uh, two issues were raised in reaction to uh, cuts, some pretty significant cuts. One was, should we pay the shareholders a dividend? And the other was, can we take some of the profit from this year and contribute it to a foundation that spends money in the communities in which the corporation operates? So we were looking at dividends, contributions, and cuts. And to their credit, the majority of the board stated it would really be uh, unfair to ask management to cut the budget, to eliminate programs, to reduce capital expenditures and productivity tools, and yet at the same time turn around and give a dividend to the shareholders, or even to make a contribution to the foundation. And I'm the president of the foundation, <laughs> and I had to. I had to try to advocate for my foundation. I raise this as an analogy to you because the $70,000 contribution that you're making for the purchase or to subsidize the purchase of land is effectively a dividend to the, share, to the, to the community of Cape Elizabeth. It's a contribution, a charitable contributions, a contribution. Meanwhile, you're asking the school board to force taxpayers to pay a participation fee for their children. And I think it's incongruent, quite frankly. I mean, it's, it's well-intentioned, but it's not congruent. So I wish you good luck with your budget. And I, I uh, again, ask for you to increase the amount of money to be spent in Cape Elizabeth schools. We are low on the totem pole in the role of towns in spending on our schools. We are high at medium in, median family income. So with respect to the schools, I know it's heresy. We're not being overtaxed relative to our peers. And I think the data would bear me out of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Um, and just for the record, um, there is no money in this budget before us tonight for the Jordan Farm. Um, that is not in the amount budgeted. I, I believe that it is the council's intent to wait until the sale of the land on the other side of town hall and um, would look to any assets coming from the sale of land. So um, there is no money in this budget for the Jordan Farm. Just want to clarify the but record. If, I may, then, if if there is a if revenue is anticipated from the sale of the land next door, I would ask that the town council dedicate that revenue to defray the athletic expense cuts that or the to increase the school budget rather than decrease it. And you know, just don't contribute this year to the land trust. I, I believe in the land trust, but as between 
participation fees and subsidy to the land trust. I think protecting children and supporting their efforts in theater, jazz, athletics is a higher and more worthy goal. Okay, thanks, Tom. Is there anyone else here to? Um, my name is Brian Hanson. I live at Fort Brook Road. And I would just like to expound on Tom's statement a little bit about the $70,000 <coughs> that is anticipated to go to the land trust. It's a slippery slope. There's a lot more land that will become generationally um, vulnerable in the next five years. And this isn't the first time it's done it. So I think we need to look very closely at how we're going to do this. Because it's going to happen again and again. Thank you. Thank Could you, you get him to clarify that some more, please? If you, have a, if you have a question, ask it. Could you expand on that? Well, as, as land transfers from one generation to another, it's a tax issue for the family. And there's numerous tracts of land around town that are going to be subject to that. And um, it's going to put pressure on the families to develop going to put pressure on the town to kick in and, you know, it's just going to be a cycle, but as I see it. What I'm asking is I think if you've read the paper lately, you know how I feel on this issue, but if you don't, I don't want to change your viewpoint. I'd like to hear whether you are in favor of the town donating money to the land trust or You'd rather see it go to the schools? That's what I meant by expand on exactly what your point of view is on that. Um, I'm not in favor of the town contributing to the land trust because I don't think it's the last time it's going to happen. And I, I really think you've got to come up with an alternative plan because there's a lot of land that's going to roll over. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Yep. Is there anyone else here tonight to speak on any of the items, item 142? Good evening. My name is Hillary Egan, and I'm a resident of Hannaford Cove Road. Um, I'm not sure at point, any points of view I will express will be new or unheard this evening, but um, I think the issue of, of cuts to the school budget has broad interest in our town. I think uh, the Cape Courier has done a good job in, in clarifying and, and bringing to the public attention some of these issues. Um, in particular, the uh, cuts to the athletic budget came to my attention because we were invited by a very worried Keith Weatherby um, as parents of children who are involved in the program uh, to help him try to decide what to do with the information that was given uh, that $50,000 of his athletic budget would be cut. Um, and I came away from that meeting very conflicted with the, the two and a half hours we had spent determining that probably the only option that we had at this point was uh, a participation fee. Um, and that I don't think represents the community's values well. And so to that point, in the last 15 years, with the help of major philanthropic and tax support, fields for kids, Cape Playgrounds, middle school renovations, Fort Williams and Gullcrest, our town has developed or improved a great number of recreational spaces, mostly fields, and this was tr done to try to meet the demand of the recreational programs available to our community. And I think it speaks to uh, how important, uh, important athletics and fitness programs are to Cape citizens. Um, and it, your comment that the school budget gets to dedicate the school, uh, the sum of money that's granted in any way they wish, if athletics 
jazz, uh, theater, and speech and debate are identified as co-curricular, then perhaps they're not in the school budget, then perhaps they, be, they fall back to the town as a community and become part of the municipal budget, and we as community members need to decide how important those programs are to us. Um, uh, the high school population of about 300, of 550 students, about 350 of them are involved in the co-curricular sports program with many athletes participating in more than one season. So depending on how you count athletes, that number can go up to over 700. Um, they participate in these sports programs, is con their participation is contingent on maintaining a healthy GPA, on daily promptness, on presenting a respectful and decent demeanor to the school community, and avoiding the pitfalls of drug and alcohol abuse. The lifelong benefit of exercise and participation in sport is written about and it's read everywhere. The benefit of, of uh, daily fitness, the positive adult role modeling, the parallel benefit of choosing to avoid risk, risk behaviors, the opportunity for having a local hero, all of which high school athletics pro provide to our teens, they're very real and evident in our community. And they're there for everyone to see and to appreciate. Sport events also provide regularly scheduled chaperoned entertainment for our mixed age group fan base. So it becomes an event that people who are beyond the school system participate in. And I question the wisdom of cutting funding to such a broad base and such a successful program. Um, clearly the community uh, may or may, understand, may not understand the impact of the two referenda that are coming up and how, what a peculiar spot the town council and the school board are in not knowing what state funds are ever even going to be available. It, it, it's like an imaginary ether zone. Um, a proposal to replace $50,000 of this year's athletic budget with one-time participation fees at $120 a year for high school athletics and at $40 a year for a middle school athlete, it's on the table. Um, and as you consider this proposal, uh, because it may kick back to the town council as to whether the town council wants participation fees or allows participation fees as part of public education, um, that most of the high school teams already have a voluntary participation cost with about 95% compliance. And in addition, this is in addition to equipment costs which are already borne by the parents or the booster organizations. Uh, currently, there are before equipment participation fees of uh, between $60 and $125 per season in seven out of the ten high school teams. Um, the equipment fees for shoes, sticks, pads, helmets, gloves, skates, cleats are already borne by the athletes at a per athlete cost per season of about $100 to $400 per, per season. The hockey team members, which is the most expensive sport, already bear the cost of ice time at over $300 per skater per season. Um, and in summary, our athletes and their parents are already paying participation and equipment fees and fundraising to support these athletic programs. Those of us with kids in the athletic program value the program deeply uh, in very committed ways, which already include heavy financial support and significant volunteer hours. I believe the town council's recommendation to cut the school budget is not the right decision. The decision does not represent the values of this community well. In particular, our young athletes' families are already a motivated and active group of citizens who have provided thousands of dollars of support and thousands of hours of productive supervision to our youth. And I do not believe it's right to say to that group, you find $50,000 just to keep your program going. Uh, in that way, I implore the town council to consider all sources of funding that perhaps cast a wider net and to vote to continue to fund these co-curricular programs at our school, at least at last year's level. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. Is there anyone else who's here to speak to items 142 through item 151? Okay. Seeing none, I will declare the public hearing closed. Okay. Is there a motion? Councillor Swift Kayata. Um, <clears throat> with the council's indulgence, I'd like to give a brief report from the finance committee. 
the town council's finance committee, which is a committee of the whole, um, and then make a motion. Um, as everyone knows tonight and from our previous meetings, the coming year is going to be a very financially challenging one for the town and its citizens. The town and school budgets face many pressures, health insurance and employee benefit increases, decreased revenues and declining state aid for education, rising fuel costs, lower investment returns, skyrocketing waste disposal costs, and so on. And the tax cap referendum that could cut property tax revenues to Cape Elizabeth by four and a half million dollars, that's about 23% down, is looming on the horizon in November. Before we actually vote on behalf of the town council, I want to thank all the citizens who have provided us with input tonight and before tonight. In addition, I must also thank our municipal, school, and community services personnel for the great contributions they make to our town. You all work very hard to make Cape Elizabeth a great place to live, and we thank you. I especially want to single out Mike McGovern, our town manager, whose leadership and creativity have been key in putting together this difficult budget. You and your staff must be commended for the professionalism you have shown in making significant and painful cuts to your budgets in order to meet the town council's expenditure target of a 5.8% increase. The school board and school administration must also be commended for their hard work in putting together the school budget. The council greatly appreciates everyone's hard work, good ideas, and willingness to listen and work with the council as we try to balance many important competing needs of all Cape citizens. The town council finance committee has met five times over the past two months to finalize tonight's budgets that are before you. At our last meeting, we took formal finance committee votes on each portion of the budget that we see tonight. The committee's votes and final recommendations are the following. First, the finance committee voted unanimously, seven, four, zero against, for the fiscal year 05 school budget that we see tonight. This school budget is not a cut, as some have said, it is an 8.1% increase in expenditures, or an increase of $1.24 million over last year's budget, the current year's budget. This is the largest increase in 10 years, even when, or in nine years, excuse me, even when the cost of the new buildings is backed out. The school tax rate, will, as proposed, will increase 86 cents to $11.25. Secondly, the Finance Committee voted unanimously, 7-0, for the Community Services Budget. The fiscal year 05 Community Services tax rate will rise by two cents to a rate of 10 cents. Third, the Finance Committee voted 5-2 for tonight's municipal budget of $7.76 million in expenditures, a 5.8% increase in expenditures over fiscal year 04. The municipal tax rate will increase by 23 cents to $3.31. Two councillors dissented on the municipal budget. Councillor Roberts, who said he would support the municipal budget if it were somewhat higher, and Councillor McGinty, who said he would support a municipal budget of approximately $13,000 lower. The other five councillors supported the municipal budget amounts that you see tonight on the agenda. That is the Finance Committee report. I would now like to make the following motion. And I'd like to suggest that we, we vote on item number 142 separately and then consider items 143 through 149 in a block, if that's all right. Um, so for item number 142, I move adoption of the general fund budget for fiscal year 05 with gross expenditures of $26,065,566 and gross revenues of $6,470,761 with a net to tax amount of 
$594,805. And the detail, I won't read the two pages of detail here, but it is here before you in this latest revised agenda for tonight with all the dollars for the, uh, the various departments. So that's my motion. Is there a second? Is there a discussion? Councillor Roberts, then Councillor McGinty. Really didn't want to start it off, but I will. I've given <coughs> the budget, both of them, uh, a great deal of thought and reflection. And I've never voted against a budget before. Uh, my comments, uh, I'm going to keep them brief. And uh, they go towards both the school and the municipal budgets. My concerns are the same with both of them. But I feel that someone needs to cast a vote to demonstrate just how much is not being properly funded in, in this budget before us, whether it be school or municipal. I'm not a person who enjoys saying we need to spend more. Um, that's not the way I do things in my own personal life. <clears throat> Unfortunately, no programs or services have been identified as unnecessary or undesired. For three years, we have been delaying, postponing, and underfunding programs, capital costs, and equipment. It's the same year in and year out. We hear, well, it's going to be another tough budget year. I would not risk sitting here alone suggesting that we spend, that we're not spending enough if I didn't honestly believe that our failure to spend now, particularly on infrastructure, capital needs, is going to cost us many times over in the near future. We're not saving money, we're merely postponing it. We are mort mortgaging our future with no assurance of the situation getting any better or our ability to pay any better in the near future. And I'm also disturbed that we are willing to treat our non-union employees as second-class citizens. Our employees are our greatest asset, but that's not the message we're sending. So for those two reasons, I will not be voting for the budget this evening. Thank you. Councilman McGinty. <clears throat> Ironically, I too have reconsidered the budget and taken a close look at it. Um, I think it's, um, I think that the, we asked the town manager to do a very difficult job to hold the increase to 5.8%. And I know he would have cared to spend a lot more money, particularly on uh, infrastructure, uh, road paving, that type of thing. But after looking over the budget, I could probably come up with about $50,000 of of things I would eliminate from the budget, but they are things that make the town run, make the town work, and so I'm actually going to change my vote and support the budget, knowing that we're we're not doing a lot of things that we probably should be doing, as uh, as Jack has said. But um, I think in looking at the school budget as well, I think an 8.1 percent increase, 1.2 million dollars, um, is reasonable. I think if you look around the around the communities you probably find that um, uh, their budgets probably range more in the three to five percent increase range than eight percent so I'm going to support the budget this year Councilor Fritz um, I <clears throat> I too want to um, uh, commend the manager in, in how well I think um, the municipal budget has been kept under control over the last number of years. And I think we did, as um, Councillor Roberts was saying, um, cut too much uh, for roads and um, some other things. And, and that's why I supported having the municipal budget go up somewhat this year um, in that 5.8. Um, I have been very concerned about the effect of um, the Pulaski referendum. And if we, it, it's rather disturbing that we've, we have both budgets going up so much this year uh, over inflation levels. Um, and, and I hope that even the amount we're increasing is not going to um, have our taxpayers so unhappy that, that uh, they will vote for the Pulaski referendum. 
And I think that that was one of the major reasons I felt we needed to keep the school budget under control. Um, but we did allow for the, what the voters approved in the renovations of the two buildings. We allowed for all the teacher uh, contracts and, and uh, meeting those um, increases and increased enrollment. So in that 8.1%. So I really feel we were generous in the school and um, it really is a decision of the schools what what they do, how they prioritize that, that uh, increase. Um, I think we have to be mindful of all the citizens in the town. Um, there are many people in the town who really cannot afford uh, to pay such a high increase in taxes. And um, they, many are on fixed income. Um, so I think this is a, a reasonable budget um, to keep up with what, what needs to be done. I, I do want to say something about the comments, although it's not part of this budget. Of, um, there were quite a few comments about the $70,000 going to the land trust, which actually is not in fact true. It doesn't, the money does not go to the land trust. It goes to purchase tr development rights. And that is a area of town that we've had studies on views um, and it was, it's the highest in the priority list of the views in the town. Um, it's, it's a, an important place in the comprehensive plan, keeping the rural character of the town. So um, I just ob object to that, the importance of that and the priority because the, that's open space for the entire community. Um, and it's just it's terribly important. Are there other comments? Councillor Mullis? This has been a very interesting budget experience. Uh, I don't want to speak too long on this issue. And I want to first, first start by saying I, I really appreciate Mr. Egan coming up and speaking. I appreciate the apparently unrelated Mrs. Egan coming up and speaking. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I think they're related. I thought they had different addresses. No? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, I wrote, I wrote the addresses down wrong. They're related by law. <laughs> and of course, Brian Hansen and Nathan Beckman and Gail Ashton. Hope I didn't miss anyone. Uh, I really appreciate it when the public come in and speak to us. And there wasn't anyone that came up and spoke tonight and asked us to reduce the budget even more. You know, no one's pointed that, that out yet. Um, you know, on, the, uh, on this year's budget, we started the process in January. Here we are in May voting on the process, on the result of that process. And a number of things have happened along the way. At the 11th hour, we find out there's going to be a huge increase in fees from RWS. And the town manager, who has done a fantastic job in putting together his budget and keeping it within the goal that we asked him to do, then suddenly had to cut, uh, what was it, about 150000 How much was that? that you $133,000 additional out of the budget. Again, there wasn't anything we identified in our budget this year that we could just do without that was unnecessary. So what doesn't get funded? More infrastructure for the town. More things that really need to be fixed that we're just passing on to next year or the year after or our children down the road. You know, uh, that payment's going to come due. And the longer you wait, the more expensive it's going to be. <clears throat> Again, on the school side, 
We started out with what we thought was a fair goal. During the course of the discussions, as of late, I've become convinced that we're just a little bit shy on what we really should be funding on the school side. This is a really tough budget in that if you look at the percentages, the town budget's going to go up 7.96%, which is off. It's just, you know, how can you, how can you forgive someone for increasing the budget 7.96%? And yet, there are very important things on the municipal side that aren't getting funded. There are very important things on the school side that are not, are not getting funded, even with that increase. <clears throat> um, we've been very concerned this year about Pulaski. I mean, I'll give you my opinion for what it's worth. Once you get beyond a 5% tax increase, you know, people are going to be mad, whether it's 5%, 6%, 10%. You know, they're, they're mad. Uh, those people that are going to vote for Pulaski, I'd say quite a few of them have already made up their mind and said, look, you know, I'm just voting for Pulaski. Um, and once you go over 5% in the town budget, whatever converts you've made at that point to vote for Pulaski, whether the budget's 7.5%, 8% or 8.1% isn't, isn't going to matter. You know, they've already decided to go for Pulaski at that point. If you shaved a tenth of a point off the town budget, you're not going to convert anyone back from the Pulaski camp to, you know, keeping the status quo. Um, which the status quo is not satisfactory either. And I really, really hope the residents of Cape Elizabeth and other communities nearby will vote for the MMA proposal. That's question one on the ballot, which will fund 55% of education statewide. That doesn't give us 55% of our educational costs, but it increases the pie for the whole state so that our little slice of the pie gets a little bit larger. But it also funds special education, I believe, at 100%. That would make a tremendous improvement to our existing budget situation. Is that money, is it our intention to pass that money through to the property tax release relief? Yes, it is, uh, or at least, you know, the vast majority of it. W would I vote in favor of putting 5 or 10% of that money to other projects needed in the town? Yes, I would. Would I have done that six months ago? Absolutely not. Six months ago, I would have said, no, every penny of it's got to go to tax relief. But, you know, knowing that I'm going to vote in the minority tonight um, to oppose this, this budget as it currently sits, I really feel there are a couple of small items. I'm not talking a huge increase in the budget, but there are some small items that aren't getting funded. I don't want Jack to be alone in uh, voting against this budget. Uh, I, I applaud the mission of the Cape Land <laughs> Trust, but if we, as a council, and they're, you know, they've essentially decided to donate that money in that direction, even though we put off the vote until we actually have the money. If we can afford to do that, then we need to put the money aside to put into the municipal budget and to put into the school department's budget. These issues on the municipal side, they aren't going to go away. Issues on the school side aren't going to go away. You know, why, why have a long, drawn-out, very expensive budget next year when we could be handling it right now? Next year, things are very uncertain where we're going to be. This year, we are certain, at least at the moment, what we're looking at. Uh, you know, I'm currently running for state representative, and I've been told, gee, you know, you really, really don't want to stand out from the other counselors on this issue. It's probably a good idea to play it safe and, and vote with everyone else and not look like you're trying to increase taxes more than any other counselor. Uh, I am running as a Republican, and Republicans are not tax increasers, and I'm not a tax increaser. But if I'm going to have a budget that's going to increase 5%, 1%, 8%, I'm a tax increaser anyway. So if I'm going to be a tax increaser, then let's spend the money on worthwhile programs. And, you know, I, I tend to get into these long speeches before a vote like this. It tends not to sway any of the other counselors, but, you know, 7.96% versus 8.96%, I think that would make a dramatic difference in the school and municipal budget. Just, just that little, you know, additional, you know, 
thirty, hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So uh, I said enough. You know, on the town side, a stitch in time saves nine. We need that money for the infrastructure. You know, we can't we can't let RWS tell us that we're going to run on rotten roads. Um, and you know, I, again, I support the Cape Land Trust. I'm not crazy about donating seventy thousand dollars to them in a year when we're having to make such. You know, even though we're increasing the school budget, enrollment's increasing, so we are making cuts. So again, I'm going to vote against this budget because I think it falls just a little short. And I wish the other councilors here tonight would reconsider and consider just bumping it up a small amount. Thank you. I want to thank Mike and the school board, the school department, Paulina Portia. Everyone has worked very hard on this budget. Um, I know that uh, countless hours have been spent by a lot of people putting it together. And a lot has been said about the budget, that it's not enough, particularly with respect to school spending. But some people say our budget is too high, that taxes are too high. I'm not happy with this budget. I'd like to do more for the schools. I'd like to do more for the towns. But the budget is a compromise process. We have three choices in this process. We can cut spending. And for the record, we're not cutting spending. We're raising spending um, in this budget. 8.1% for the schools and 5.8, I think, for the town, 5.7. We can raise taxes. We are raising taxes by 8%. Some might call it 7.96. But where I learned math, I round that up to 8%. Um, and, you know, there were people here tonight who said, in essence, raise my taxes. I appreciate that, and I really am glad you came, um, and I welcome that. And I, speaking for myself, I share your view. Um, but we're generally parents who are in our best way during years. Um, I've found on the council that, in fact, I don't hear at this meeting from people who say, don't raise my taxes. Maybe they're embarrassed to come. Maybe they're embarrassed to say I'm on a fixed income. But they do say it to me in the IGA. They do say it to me in the neighborhood. Um, so, you know, there are other town residents, particularly our senior citizens, who are not as blessed as those of us who are in our, you know, the, our middle years um, and in our best wage earning years. And so I just cannot support a tax increase beyond 8%. Um, I think it's just too burdensome for some of our senior citizens. Um, and then lastly, the last thing we can do if we don't cut spending, we raise taxes, is raise revenue. And I continue to support raising revenue through a fee at Fort Williams. Some might want to call me Johnny OneNote. I've raised this three years in a row. Um, I believe we could raise $200,000 a year that at a minimum would make Fort Williams self-supporting. I mean, I could join others and have a protest vote that um, I don't like this budget because we could have a fee at Fort Williams and we could raise a couple of hundred thousand, which would make Fort Williams self-supporting and would free up a hundred, a hundred and thirty thousand for other purposes. Um, but the budget process is a compromise. I mean, that's what it is. We don't get everything we like. There are seven of us here. So um, while I'm not crazy about this budget, and I wish there was more money, and I wish we were raising some revenue. I walked through Fort Williams yesterday. You couldn't find a parking space there. You could not find a parking space there. And I continue to say Fort Williams is free for everyone except Cape Elizabeth residents. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just as frustrated with this budget as people who are voting against the budget. But unlike people in Augusta and people in Washington who can shut down the federal government or shut down the state government, I'm not prepared to do that. We need a budget. I think it's the best budget we can come up with under the circumstances. And I would also say I have children in the schools. I have one in the high school. I have one in the middle school. Um, I don't like participation fees either. But as between asking parents for a participation fee 
or we're asking all of our taxpayers, some of whom um, are in more difficult situation, I guess I, I have to err on the side of saying um, that 8% is as high a tax increase as um, uh, I could support. And um, I would encourage people to um, get involved, get involved in the Education Foundation. I would join my fellow counselors in asking that uh, Cape Elizabeth residents consider supporting um, the referendum on the, on the June ballot, which would provide increased funding to our schools. So um, again, with that, I would just say, no, I don't really like the budget. Um, I would have liked to have raised a couple of hundred thousand more from Fort Williams, but I'm going to vote for this budget because um, it's the best that we can do. And I do think that we are providing enough money to maintain the excellence of our school and maintain um, our town services. So that's all I'll say on the matter. Well, everybody's looking at me like I'm supposed to say something. You don't have to. And I wasn't going to, but now I feel like I have to. <laughs> I agree with um, virtually every counselor up here tonight. And I agree that the budget is too low. And I agree that the budget is too high. And it simply makes our town manager's comments ring all the more true that we heard from him every time we started a budget meeting. Um, that he was unhappy with the municipal budget both because it was asking for an increase that was too high and asking for an increase that was not enough. And it is an incongruity, but it is a true incongruity, as incongruous as that may sound. <laughs> there is no perfect answer here. We are desperately lacking for funds for needed services on the municipal side and in the school side. We all know that. There is not a one of us up here that doesn't understand that and acknowledge it. And I don't think there's a resident in the town that doesn't understand it and acknowledge it. But there is a limit to how far we can ask people to dig into their wallets and checkbooks month after month and year after year. And we are, we are passing along an 8% increase in a property tax rate that is already choking an awful lot of people. And as unhappy as I am with the number, um, I am simply unwilling to increase it any further. I know we need capital in infrastructure expenses. I know we need additional programs in the schools. I have three boys going through the school system. I write checks for baseball and for soccer and for we're writing checks monthly for different school related activities it's an endless process um, and i don't anticipate that that's going to stop anytime soon um, but that being said i will support the budget by vote despite the fact that i don't support it in principle thank you and the Manager is asked to say something. Just, just very briefly, I'd like to thank everyone for their uh, encouragement and their involvement in the budget process. A lot of difficult decisions were made along the way, uh, and everyone involved in the budget process had to make difficult decisions. The department heads, the, all the school officials, the school board, the town council, the finance committee. And yet, throughout the whole process, there was never a raised voice. Uh, everyone understood the difficulties understood the difficulties that was before them and handled all the issues professionally and uh, you know with a good deal of understanding I think a lot of that is is a credit to the leader of the Finance Committee uh, Ann Swift Catter for her guidance and uh, her work and time and getting the facts out and then uh, looking you know always for savings and trying to keep everyone work together so I'd like to thank all of the council and particularly Ann for uh, her efforts in uh, bringing the budget to this point. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Now, any further discussion? Seeing none, we will vote on item 142. Two.
All in favor of the budget? One, two, three, four, five in favor. And opposed? Councillors Roberts and Mould. Thank you. The next item are items. And do you have a motion that will take yes. these together? Yes, I do, Madam Chair. Um, I would move that we um, consider items 143 through 149 as a block. Do we need to vote on that? That we I consider would, them as a block? Let's consider them as a block unless someone wants to amend your motion to take something out of it. Okay. See, do I have a second? To the motion. What was the block again? 143. The block is through 149. 143 through 149. And, and just, just for to list people at list home, it's the sewer fund budget, the Riverside Cemetery fund budget, the Museum at Portland Headlight fund budget, the Spurwink Church fund budget, the Fort Williams Park Capital fund budget, the Thomas Jordan Trust fund budget, and the Rescue fund budget. And I would move that we consider these as a block. Is there a second? Any discussion? <clears throat> All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, zero. Thank you. And then I would move that we approve all of those budgets. And I, were we moving to consider them as a block? Oh, I'm sorry. And now yes. we have to all in to, favor to of approve them. Approving yeah. them. We need a, excuse me, we need a, we need a second. 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 Okay. okay, all in favor of approving items 143 through 149. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Thank you. And now we are on item 150, which is acceptance of grants. And um, these are specifically a Homeland Security grant in the amount of 71000 a uh, law enforcement terrorism prevention program grant in the amount of 36,000, a seat belt enforcement project grant which would pay for three radar units, a supplemental state homeland security grant of 134,000, and an $11,000 grant from the Fort Williams Foundation for an engineering study of the Goddard Mansion. Is there a motion? Move acceptance of the grant. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Okay, the next item is item 151, which is um, an application to um, approve a grant application to the Maine Library of Geographic Information Board. That's an application for a $10,000 grant. Michael, is there anything you want to no, say on that? Just very briefly, uh, Maureen O'Meara prepared this application, and it, it doesn't really indicate on it, but it is working with six other communities. It's a seven community project in which we would work to jointly apply for this grant. This is Cape Elizabeth Chair and would update our parcel map so that when you look at the parcel map and you see homes on it, they would actually probably be on the lot and not uh, <laughs> askew. Okay. The, the, our local share is, uh, would come out of the existing funds set aside uh, for the GIS system as well, not new money. Is there a motion? Councillor swift Keada. I move that the council approve this grant application um, for ten thousand grant, ten thousand dollar grant to upgrade parcel maps. And is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Next item, item one fifty two, is the approval of Fort Williams Park uses. And uh, in our package, there are four letters. Um, which would provide uh, approval. I will just read down through them. First is to approve Family Fun Day for June 19th, 2004, with a rain date of June 26th. The second um, date is the Down East Region Porsche Club. Uh, no. I'm sorry. Let her continue. Um, sorry, go ahead. 
for uh, May 22nd, 2005. The third proposed use of Fort Williams is the United States Coast Guard change of command ceremony on July 23rd, 2004. And the Haunted Lighthouses Ghost Walk scheduled for October 9th and 23rd, 2004. Ann. Before we make that a motion. Uh, sorry. I, um, going by the most recent agenda, I, it's confusing because there were two. One was the one we got with our packet, and then there was tonight's version. Okay, I'm reading version. from tonight's, I thought. There are three items. The Down East Region Porsche Club has been deleted from the most okay. recent agenda. Okay, so it's Porsche. So there are three items? Yes, the agendas that okay. were in front of us on the We table. expect the Porsche Club would come back to it a later date. Okay, so for the three remaining items, Family Fun Day, June 19th, the Coast Guard change of command on the 23rd, and the Haunted Lighthouse's Ghost Walk, is there a motion? I'd like to make a motion that we approve the, uh, those three uses of uh, Fort Williams Park. Second. Okay, any discussion? On uh, discussion, I would just like to mention to the uh, public that Family Fun Day is June 19th, and I hope many, many residents will come down. There'll be a parade at 10.30. It'll start at the cookie jar and then go into Fort Williams Park. And during the course of the day, we have a number of bands that'll be playing at the, uh, on the baseball diamond, as well as plenty of food and fun for the whole family. We are still trying to raise the money for fireworks. So if anyone out there wants to make a donation to the Family Fun Day Firework Fund, uh, please contact me, Councillor Moles. You can find me on the town website uh, or around town. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Yes, Councillor Harris. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion? Hmm. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. The next item, item 153, is approval of the selection of Peyton Construction as the construction manager for the high school renovation project. Um, this has been on our agenda um, for the last couple of meetings. Um, I'm a member of the building committee. We had a meeting last week, those of us who are members of the building committee, with school board members of the building committee and the school department. Um, I have also met with um, the principal, I guess the um, principal negotiator for Peyton Construction. Um, we had a long negotiating session with um, the town, the school's lawyer and uh, Dr. Frisella. Last week, Tom Frisella called me this morning and indicated that Peyton had agreed to some changes in the contract as requested. Um, by the uh, school department. So um, we are suggesting tonight that we approve the selection of Peyton as the construction manager for the high school renovation project. And what we are doing tonight is approving, again, the appointment of Peyton as the manager. The school board itself will execute the contract. So I would move approval of Peyton. Is there a second? Second. Okay, discussion? Councilor Moll? Yes, in those uh, discussions, um, the last time we had this discussion, um, Liam mm -hmm. had quite a few comments. Was he able to make those meetings? Yes, he was. Was he and happy yes. with how they turned out? Um, I cannot speak for him, but he um, was at the meeting where we negotiated for several hours with Peyton, and um, I believe that Peyton um, made a lot of uh, changes that were um, changes suggested by Liam. He, it's he a negotiation, a so I, I, again, I can't speak with him, but um, it's a negotiation. You give up, you, you trade, and I think um, it's fair to say that Dr. Frisella believes that this is in the best interest of the school. and. I'm satisfied that there was a lot of hard-nosed bargaining with Peyton and that the contract is much improved. Further discussion? Yes. Yes. Um, the 
the agenda to the second part of that. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I didn't. Did you deliberately leave that out? Deliberately left that out because I wanted to just do Peyton first. Okay. So, all in favor of approving Peyton as the construction manager? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. And the second part of item 153 is amending the building committee charge to uh, return to the original charge. We had. Uh, changed, amended the charge last um, month. Um, we had some concerns with the superintendent leaving to search for the new superintendent, a number of new school board members that there needed to be more or continued involvement of the school building committee, which was appointed and consists of three councilors, three school board members, and three members of the public. We have since learned that, in fact, um, state law does not permit us to amend a school building committee charge once it has already been created and approved. So what is before you tonight is to amend it back to the original charge. And it's basically just to correct an action that we really were not authorized to take. Some might argue that the action last month was null and void, but this would just correct that action. In the, the school superintendent and the, the building committee leadership has indicated oh, a yes. willingness to continue to work uh, with the building committee with any substantial change that, that might occur. So the concerns of the council that were within the building committee proposed amended charge uh, have also agreed to it. Yeah, and there was one other important point that came out of our meeting last week with the school board, and that is that because of the departure of uh, Dr. Frisella, the school board tomorrow night is going to be discussing and considering um, hiring an owner's rep um, in particular because of the change in leadership. So I think that also gave some of us who were concerned about the leadership on the project um, a higher degree of confidence in this period where there's a lot of transitions going on. So. So I would move that we amend the building committee charge to return to the original charge. I don't believe the chairman can move. Oh, uh, okay. To make yeah. motions. Can they? Is that right? I thought I could, but. I thought they had to come. That's standard practice. I know it's. <laughs> Second. But since I'm on the building committee. Oh, okay. Second. I, it seems to me to be the best person to update this. There's been a second. Any further discussion? As an item of comment, I'd just like, and as a member of the building committee, um, I would like to simply stress my willingness and I think probably the willingness of all of the members of the committee to remain available to the school department for any assistance that the school department might want in overseeing the completion of both the Pond Cove and high school projects. Um, we've yet to see ground broken on those projects. There is a lot to be done over the course of the next year and a half. And uh, even though the school building committee will not formally exist to oversee and work with the superintendent's office um, on these projects, um, I'd like to make it clear that, um, that, it, that I, at least personally, and again, I assume that most of the other, if not all of the other members of the building committee, would also be willing uh, to provide input in any way that the school department would see helpful. Okay. Thank you, David. So we've had a motion and a second, unorthodox as it may be, and um, it would be to, again, go back to the original building committee charter. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. The next item is item 154, um, small alewife brook lot. And I see John Herrick here from the Conservation Commission. John, would you like to say anything about this item? <laughs> Well, let's say, uh, my name is John Herrick. I'm uh, chair of the Conservation Commission. Uh, there were two lots 
that was presented to the town for potential purchase by the Portland Water District. Uh, one lot we thought was <clears throat> really not usable by the town and was uh, $29,000, and we do not recommend that the town uh, try to purchase that lot. It would be basically inaccessible to most people from the town, perhaps more accessible to South Portland residents, but not us. This small lot on Old Ocean House Road on the old, old, uh, uh, the old White Brook uh, might be useful, I'm not sure that it will be, but it might well be useful for educational purposes and perhaps uh, some work uh, with local university for uh, stocking uh, airwives uh, uh, in that stream from, from contact by a professor at the community college in this area. Uh, uh, we did not follow up on that uh, aggressively, but then may, we may still want to do that in the future. So we do recommend this. I think the, uh, the manager has, has arranged a situation. There was, there was a, a net zero cost to the town, I believe, as, as stated in his letter to you. Um, and uh, so I, I think the commission would recommend that we proceed with this purchase. Thank you. Thank you, John. Are there any questions for John? I have a question. I'm not sure if it's John or for Mike, uh, town manager, perhaps. But uh, John, I'll, I'll pose it by you. Do you know? Um, when I was reading this. I couldn't tell. It appeared the town had purchased this lot or negotiated the sale with uh, uh, Alvin Jordan at one point. Was that with an arm twist that was to be taken by him <laughs> domain, or was it uh, an outright <coughs> purchase that was agreeable to all? I can't answer that question. Perhaps somebody else here can. I, I don't know the details. It was uh, during the era when the town was acquiring quite a few easements, either the town or the water district, and compensation was paid, but I, I don't know any of the details. Uh, Mr. Adams isn't looking. He must not remember the details either, it was probably even before he was on the council. Way back then. Way back. Well, don't remember, Henry? I guess I'll wait for my discussion until after we've had a motion on the table to discussion. Okay, is there a motion? <laughs> yes. I'll move that on item 154-03-04 that the uh, town purchase that small lot adjacent to Alewife Brook at Old Ocean House Road for $2,500 which shall be expensed to the Greenbelt account. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? Councillor Roberts? Uh, my concern would be that if it, if it was taken by eminent domain, that the land owner should be given first refusal to purchase that back if it's if it be so desired. Um, I know when the public takes something that way, certainly if they no longer have a need for it, that they should have the first refusal on it. And, I would like to know that before I voted on it. Michael? I, I do know that it wasn't taken by eminent domain. Uh, what I don't know is, is you know, how friendly the discussions were or, or any of that. I, I, uh, I don't know the details. I know when, you know when I first came here quite a few years ago, I remember looking at all the files, and those that, those that were quite controversial still, I recall, uh, they, they really flew off the paper. This was not one of those. There was barely any information on it. My sense is that uh, it, it was not, you know, just wasn't disagreeable. Okay, and even, you know, even under the circumstance, if we didn't acquire it, it would then be offered by bid to anyone. It doesn't. It doesn't go back to uh, under the water district land distribution land disposition policy. It does does not go back to the original person as white or something. I would, I would definitely expect that they would purchase it as well as, as we might. I guess my a second follow-up question would be, if the landowner had that frontage on the road, does that significantly increase his ability to use that land down the, down the road? You know, Ill, Ill White Book is is protected under the the uh, state law uh, as a stream, and there's certain setbacks to it, and most of this lot. Is, w is within that setback area. That's why the, the value is so low. But it would be the street frontage that might potentially give them the, the rights on the back on the dry land. That's the, I guess, what my question would be. 
John, do you know? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think that's that would be the case, but I'm not sure about that. Councilor McGinty. Um, what's the connection with the sewer fund? The connection with the sewer fund is that the proceeds uh, from, the, let, me, let me just step back for a second. Uh, when all of these different parcels were acquired uh, for pump stations, for treatment plants, and, and the rest, uh, the Portland Water District included them as part of the sewer bonds. They, they capitalized it over a period of years. Uh, some of those bonds are beginning to be paid off. Some of them are, are yet to be paid off. Uh, those bonds are repaid through our sewer fund. When the water district sells any piece of property that relates to the Cape Elizabeth sewer plant, and, you know, including the land, the proceeds go back into a sewer account at the Portland Water District, uh, designated specifically for Cape Elizabeth. Uh, what, what this motion proposes is that we, we pay the water district the $2,500 that they're requesting, that we then, at, rather than just keep the money in that fund, that we ask the Portland Water District to return those funds, and because originally they were sewer funds, although way back then the town uh, actually used to contribute a lot from the general fund to the sewer fund, and you know, who knows how it turns out, but anyway, so that the money would come back here because it was from the water district, it was sewer related, that it go to the sewer fund, and then, it's, and then it's proposed that the sewer fund, in turn, return the money back to the Greenbelt account. So in the end, the money's moved around about three times. The, the lawyers have gotten happy, you know, doing deeds. And, uh, you know, a few checks have gone along the way, and the bank's made a little bit of income on fees, but that would be it. <coughs> Uh, Michael, I have a question, or yes. I don't know whether it's for Michael or John, but what do we know what or how the land will be disposed of if the town doesn't purchase it tonight? No. One says yes, one says no. So. I, I don't know. As okay. a member of the commission, I don't know. Uh, maybe Michael does. Michael? Yeah, if you read the uh, first paragraph of the March 26th letter from Norm Woodell, the district has two parcels of land it no longer has use for located in your municipality. In our policy for disposing of such lands, the district must first offer the parcels to the municipality uh, before selling it on the open market, either by competitive bid or by advertised sale. Therefore, this letter is to notify you that these parcels are available to you at fair market value if you desire to purchase them. Uh, I've read that, and I guess I was wondering do we know whether it, it looks like it's not a buildable lot? It looks like it's resource protection. It looks like it will stay exactly where it is and wouldn't be particularly attractive. Marianne, the, the, the following, there's a summary sheet as part of the packet that's right behind the cover letter that, that I think addresses most of that. It says that 90% of the land is wetlands and is not buildable. Um, it, it also, uh, Jack, I think addresses one of your concerns. It does mention that it was sold originally um, from Alvin Jordan in 1972 by negotiated sale, and it even mentions the, the purchase price at that time. As I was wondering if the negotiated sale was one of, well, one of these deals. Yeah, well, 3000 to $3,500. I was doing one of my old lawyer tricks of, I knew the answer to my question. Did it, I think it's basically an unbuildable lot, and where I'm going with it is I'm not sure the town wants it. Um, I haven't seen it in any, previous to this, in any inventory of land that anyone has said is a really desirable lot. And, and I get back to we have limited resources, and once you acquire something, you do have some stewardship and responsibility for it, even if it's free today. So um, it struck me that if it's unbuildable, it will probably just stay the way it is, and maybe that's not a bad thing, but we don't have to take care of it. So that's where I was going with it. <clears throat> so. Can I ask um, John, what I did not check this back against the trail and potential trail map. 
it, does it fall in that category? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I <coughs> excuse me. I did, and it does not fall anywhere near um, existing trails or even uh, near proposed trails. So this this could would not ever, in my view, be part of a um, of a trail, Greenbelt Trail system. Um, there were, we'd like to develop trails in that area, um, but we can't see any possibility of that at this time. I do think it would be uh, advantageous to the town, potentially, uh, although it's hard to see that right now, that the uh, obtaining title to this land uh, would be a good thing, because it is a, it is a stream, it's a wetland, that certainly it won't be built on. Uh, on the current uh, law, um, and I don't know that the Portland Water District can do anything with it, but if we could obtain it for no or very little cost, uh, as far as the maintenance of it is concerned, we would treat it like probably any other um, uh, area that the Conservation, Conservation Commission would be involved in. It would be mostly, uh, if we don't totally in this case, any, any volunteer laborer would be on our part would be doing it. and I do not foresee for some, such a small area of, la of land that's basically isolated from uh, other trails where there would be any expense involved in maintenance of this land. And it may be useful as, as, as part of the uh, uh, in White Brook system, it may be useful for some educational purpose in the future. So I think we just thought it would be advantageous to the town to, uh, to possess it. Uh, we don't see any downside to this. We want to see some potential to it in the future. Thank you, John. And could I ask the manager, do we see any, up if we, if the town is to purchase this lot, do we see any advantages or disadvantages to us owning it? I, you know, my, my initial reaction is to defer to the recommendation of the Conservation Commission. Uh, they looked at it, I believe the vote was unanimous, that it, that it be retained for educational purposes. Uh, you know, to direct town liability, no direct town benefit. I think the one stated uh, by the commission. You know, beyond that, in, in areas like this, uh, where you have a resource such as Air White Brook, you know, along a, a major road, you know, one never knows uh, what you might be faced with, you know, in future years. You know, some of the issues, you know, that Council Roberts was looking at and by the town owning it, uh, it sometimes you know, enables you to stop something else that enables you to protect an important resource. And Ale White Brook uh, is recognized as an important resource. And you know, just today, I did receive the permit from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so the state actually, uh, g giving that the Ale White Harvesting Plan their approval. So uh, after spending so much time on that deal. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would, it, would, it would be nice that we could have access to uh, to take those little ale whites and put them in there and see what happens. <laughs> uh, the vote was six to one, Mike. Six to one? Yes, yes it was. Okay. Thank you, John. Is there further discussion? Okay. All in favor of authorizing the uh, purchase of the, I'm sorry? Is there a motion? I thought we had a motion. No. Yeah, I, yes, I, we did. I made the motion so we could have the discussion. And so we've had the motion. For once, I'm, for once I'm right. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's been a long year. <laughs> um, and it, it's, it's hard for the public to appreciate it, but when you're up here, and it's easy to to lose track of whether there's been a motion or a second. And anyway, um, we have had a motion and a second, so we will um, have a vote now. <laughs> All in favor of the purchase of the Yale White Brook parcel? One, two, three, four. And opposed? We got out of that seven old oh, here by there. <laughs> Robert Lynch and Backer opposed. And the next item, my great pleasure to discuss this, although it's with regret also. Um, item 154 is a recommendation from the town clerk 
to appoint um, Sherry Gower as the election warden for the town of Cape Elizabeth for calendar year 2004. And I'm sorry, did I misstate that? Okay. Um, anyway, um, Henry Adams, our election warden of 20 years, is uh, stepping down because he finds himself a candidate in June for the school board. So as a candidate, he cannot serve as election warden. And I just want to say a few things about Henry um, before we move to appointing his successor because um, his service to the town is uh, legion. Um, Henry has um, served, as I mentioned, for 20 years as a warden. He's uh, presided over over 50 elections, and he's done so with grace, intelligence, good humor, and great service to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. And I would just also mention that that's not his only service to the town. Um, he was elected to the town council. He served as council chair twice in the nine years that he was on the town council. And um, as everyone knows, he has just been one of those citizens that really makes our town special. So um, as he steps down from this, we would like to thank Henry for his services, unrivaled and unsurpassed. So thank you, Henry. And with that, I will um, open up for a motion. I would move that uh, we at the town council appoint uh, Sharon Sherry uh, J. Gower as the election warden for the town of Cape Elizabeth for the calendar year 2004. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Oh, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I think the uh, school children of Cape Elizabeth will like this because this is the famous Mrs. Gower um, who works in the lunchroom, and so all of the children know her as well. So thank you, Sherry, for agreeing to take on this duty. The next item, 156, is a settlement of a, um, a lawsuit that um, was brought against the town in the matter of... Uh, Ram's Head Partners, LLC versus the town of Cape Elizabeth. Michael? Yes, this uh, has been an interesting case. It, it uh, went to Superior Court, it went to the Maine Supreme Court, and the Maine Supreme Court or the Law Court uh, remanded it, it back to the town with some comments that we ought to invest some money in tape recorders, uh, uh, amongst some other mm -hmm. comments. And, uh, you know, it's met a couple of different times with the town attorney on this. The uh, council also had a, an extensive discussion one evening in executive session. And evaluating this particular case, the, the future of uh, cost of litigating it, the, the potential still for a loss, you know, based on uh, all the different comments we've read from the different courts over the years. Uh, the town attorney and I uh, both feel, Mike Hill in this case being the town attorney, uh, both feel that it's in the best interest of the town to uh, settle the case. I also discussed it with Matt Sturgis and uh, our town assessor who also agrees this is a fair settlement. Uh, the uh, settlement amount is $45,000 that the town would pay, uh, and this relates to the taxes uh, committed for the years beginning, the tax years beginning April 1, 2001 in April year 2002, which for in budget years would be fiscal year 2002 and fiscal year 2003. Uh, you know, I, I, and you might note, uh, we spoke about the budget process and the way, uh, despite some difficulties, everyone got along nicely, and th this was the most unusual uh, lawsuit in that, uh, you know, the parties remained very friendly and cordial throughout while we had, while we had disagreements on principles. Uh, you know, everyone just could not have been more understanding of everyone else's position. And, you know, so often in, in our uh, civil society today, we, we see violent disagreements and, and lack of understanding that someone could have another point of view. And in this instance, uh, everyone uh, really got along 
nicely, and uh, the 45,000 proposed, by the way, could come from the overlay, which is the amount that when you calculate the tax rate, it's the amount of the difference between the imputed amount when the budget is adopted and the actual amount that it comes in. And during last year's budget process, uh, because of the revaluation, there was a, a much larger overlay than there would, there would traditionally be. Uh, and Matt used some of that up in meeting with all the citizens, about $45,000, almost an equal amount, uh, in abatements, and another 45000 would go toward this account. And there's still a, a substantial balance of over 300000 in that overlay, uh, which the Council's had uh, some discussions about. Uh, and if it were not for that, our revenue, I think, you know, you see those monthly revenue reports each month. If not for that, we, throughout the whole year, we wouldn't be making our revenue balance. But because of that, we're hopeful to restoring our surplus to, by my calculation, and some disagree on the, the methodology of uh, about 75% of what it should be, whereas this year it was 67% of, of what it should be, in, in by, by my calculation, although some we have different ways of looking at it, as we'll find out at a workshop this summer. Uh, so anyway, I would uh, encourage you to authorize me to sign the settlement agreement. And again, I'd like to express my appreciation to Mike Hill for all his work and this, to Matt Sturgis, to the Board of Assessment Review, as well as to John Higgins, uh, who is the principal of the litigant at Ramstead Partners, and to uh, Gerald Petrich, Petrich Sally, I don't know why I have trouble saying that tonight, uh, who is his attorney uh, they, uh, in, in the, in, at the end of the matter. They all uh, worked uh, very cooperatively with us. Thank you, Michael. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. In favor of approving the settlement. Okay. Um, I don't see many citizens here, but it is that time in our agenda for um, citizens' items. Uh, any citizens who would like to bring up anything to our attention that was not on the agenda? Seeing none, um, before we move to adjourn, I just want to take a minute. This is my last meeting presiding as um, council chair, and I have learned now why Jack Roberts smiled last year when he said it was his last meeting as council chair. It is uh, certainly a privilege uh, to do it, but it is also, um, it's hard work being in the middle and uh, trying to remember whether motions have been made and seconded. So, um, but I appreciate um, the year and the opportunity. Um, it, it's just a pleasure to work with all of you. Um, I appreciate your kindness and your patience. I especially want to thank Michael and Deborah, who get my phone calls almost every morning on various things, and they will be as glad as anyone, I guess, that my time is up. and. Uh, Councillor Swift Keata, who will be uh, replacing me, will get to make the calls to them. Um, but I do appreciate your kindness and patience and all of the Council. Um, you are indeed a pleasure to work with. Um, we don't always agree on every issue, but I know that each and every one of you um, tries to do what's in the best interest of the people of Cape Elizabeth. And so it really has been a privilege to um, serve you and the town in this capacity, and uh, I just want to thank you for that. With that, um, I would uh, welcome a motion to adjourn. So moved. Oh, I'm sorry, before we adjourn, let me just mention some upcoming dates. Um, uh, as was mentioned earlier this evening, I just want to emphasize again the household hazardous waste pickup this Saturday morning from 9 to 2. 1. One. Very important um, for residents. Uh, we haven't done this in a couple of years, and now's your chance to clean out all that stuff that's in your basement and garage that you can't normally bring to the transfer station. We also, um, I'd mentioned that the town's Memorial Day Parade is May 31st, and um, the parade will begin at, I think, 9 o'clock? 9 a.m. sharp. So um, the next meeting of the Town Council, which is the first meeting of our fiscal year 05, is June 14th, 2004. So I think, have I covered everything, folks? 
I, a motion. Are you going to continue your workshop after this meeting or not? Um, we, we have a meeting of the Thomas Jordan Trust Grants Committee, but uh, if we could just take a few minutes with the whole council, we were in the midst of discussing some dates on calendars for okay. workshops. If we could just finalize that, it shouldn't take more than a few minutes. Okay. So we will go back into workshop after this. That's open to the public. And with that, a motion to adjourn would be in order. So moved. Second. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Deborah, close enough.